In 1976, we could fly from New York to London in about three hours. Today, it takes seven. While many consider the moon landing to be the pinnacle of 20th century engineering, in some ways, the Concorde is actually a more impressive accomplishment. A story of mankind bending iron and steel to our will, an aluminum Icarus that scoffed at earthly limitations of physics and economics. It was a plane that flew faster than a 9mm bullet, faster than the Earth rotated, you could beat the Earth to your destination. It flew so high you could see the curvature of the planet, our dark blue atmosphere, and outer space. All for less than the price of a first-class international ticket today. It all started in 1947 with this guy, Chuck Yeager, the first man to fly faster than the speed of sound and a veritable badass. When a fighter pilot shoots down five enemy planes, he is known as an ace. Chuck Yeager became an ace in a single day. When he volunteered to be the first person to break the sound barrier, the flight was deemed so dangerous that people suggested he get life insurance beforehand. At the time, no one knew if it was even possible for a human to break the speed of sound. Would the plane disintegrate against the wall of compressed air at the sound barrier? Could the human body handle these kinds of forces? He would be flying in the Bell X-1, a plane that didn't exactly inspire confidence. It was essentially a bullet with a rocket strapped to the back of it like Wile E. Coyote and Looney Tunes. On top of that, when the day of the flight finally came, Yeager had two broken ribs. He had fallen off a horse a few days before. He didn't tell anyone, and he just toughed it out. They don't make him like that anymore. Against all odds, at 45,000 feet above the Mojave Desert, Yeager broke the sound barrier, reaching speeds of Mach 1.05, 5% higher than the speed of sound. The Bell X-1 was proof that humans could fly faster than the speed of sound, but it was hardly practical. Just a few years later, the space race would begin, and the whole world would be obsessed with the idea of human beings going up into space. But a few engineers in Europe had a crazy idea. Instead, they would specialize in going sideways. So while the space race was happening, a second race began. The race for supersonic commercial flight. There were three players developing supersonic transport planes, the US, the Soviet Union, and a joint effort between France and the UK. There was a feeling that this was a winner-take-all market. People at the time really thought that all travel would be supersonic in the future, and we wouldn't use any conventional planes. After all, why would you? Supersonic planes could travel from Los Angeles to San Francisco in 17 minutes. But as it turns out, it wasn't quite that straightforward. There were a few major problems to contend with. First was the heat. You ever seen a meteor burn up? Well, that's not because of some magical space property of meteors. It's because they're just a rock going really, really fast. When you rub your hands together, they get warm because of friction. And when the air rubs against a rock or a plane at high speeds, it also generates friction. So you have to prevent the passengers from cooking like an easy bake oven, but that's actually the easy part. You also have to prepare for the plane itself to change shape because the metal gets so hot, it can expand by up to 10 inches. The plane literally gets longer while it flies. If you can keep the passengers cool and the plane intact, you have another problem, the sonic boom. You see, when an object crosses the speed of sound, it creates a loud shock wave. That crack at the tip of a bullwhip, that's a sonic boom. One of the reason gunshots are so loud is a sonic boom, but the magnitude of the boom is proportional to an object's size. Gunshots hurt your ears, but a plane's sonic boom can shatter windows, cause cattle to stampede, and even collapse roofs. The cause of the sonic boom is really interesting. Essentially, the sound waves in front of the plane get squeezed as you get faster and faster, and then form a shock wave as you cross the sound barrier. But the people on the plane never hear the sonic boom. They outrun it because of course, they're moving faster than the speed of sound. But for the people on the ground, it can cause a lot of issues. As a matter of fact, it soon became apparent that domestic flights over land would be near impossible due to disruption from the sonic boom. During just one testing period in Oklahoma City, there were 9,594 complaints of building damage. The final challenge is drag, and I'm not talking about RuPaul. The faster an airplane travels, the more the air resists it, the more drag there is. You need clever design to minimize drag, with narrow, swept back wings, for example. But these little tight wings are very bad at generating lift for taking off and landing. This leads to some funky designs, like the dramatic angle of takeoff and landing of the Concorde and the famous droop snoot that had it looking like a bird of paradise flower. With all these challenges, every single attempt at supersonic flight ran way over budget. Local governments hated it because of the sonic booms, and environmentalists began to complain about the impact to the ozone layer due to the exceptionally high altitude of these flights. Because of these and other issues, in 1971, the US and Boeing decided to drop out 
of the supersonic transport race. We never got a plane, but we did get a basketball team. The Seattle Supersonics were named after Boeing's attempt at supersonic transport, the ill-fated Boeing 2707. The Seattle Supersonics eventually moved to Oklahoma and became the Oklahoma City Thunder, which is ironic because the sound of thunder is caused by, you guessed it, a sonic boom. With the US out of the supersonic race, that left the Soviet Union's Tupolev Tu-144 and the UK-France joint venture, the Concorde. Now, there's a good chance you're familiar with the Concorde, but you've probably never heard of the Tupolev Tu-144, also known as the Concordski. <laughs> Which is funny because technically, they beat the Concorde to market. They had their first successful supersonic flight four months before the Concorde did. But this victory may have been the very thing that killed it. You see, in this era, the Soviet Union was intensely competitive with the West. And so, while the Concorde and Boeing's timelines were continually pushed back due to technological challenges, <laughs> the Soviets sort of ignored those and somehow magically hit their deadlines without fail. For example, in 1963, the Soviet government promised that the Tu-144 would fly in 1968. And when did it first fly? December 31st, 1968, the very last day possible to hit the party's timeline. And its introduction to passenger service was timed with the 60th anniversary of the communist revolution. The only problem was the plane was clearly not ready. Toilets were broken, reading lights didn't work, and ceiling panels were crooked. But there were also deeper, more insidious issues. During 144 flights, the Tupolev Tu-144 suffered more than 226 failures. Pretty much every part of this plane had issues. But the worst effect was the metal itself. It was prone to cracks forming under the intense stress and heat of supersonic flight. In 1973, a Tu-144 exploded over France, killing 14 people. Because of all these defects, the Tu-144 was never quite reliable enough to be put into regular service. It turns out bureaucratic Soviet corner cutting is not exactly the right approach for a metal tube full of people hurtling through the air at two times the speed of sound. I mean, the whole world saw what that approach did to nuclear power. <coughs> Chernobyl! <coughs> After a second crash in 1978, the Tu-144 was pulled from passenger service completely. And that left just one supersonic plane, the Concorde. The Concorde was genuinely a marvel of engineering. One of the greatest things humans created in the 20th century. It was well built. It just worked. Whereas the Tupolev plane flew 102 flights, the Concorde flew 50,000. 2.5 million people were lucky enough to experience the joy of supersonic travel. And what was that experience like? Well, it was exceptional. A round trip ticket cost about $10,000 in today's money. Expensive for sure, but kind of similar to a first class international ticket today. The clientele was wealthy, but also a lot of business people whose companies were paying. You could fly to Europe in the morning, have a meeting there, and be back in time to sleep in your own bed that night. New York to London took around three and a half hours which was the perfect amount of time for a full, multiple course French meal prepared by expert chefs. You sat there having a glass of champagne and some delicious filet mignon, never having to worry about turbulence because the Concorde flew above it. As a matter of fact, you'd be flying so high, if you looked out your window, you'd see the curve of the earth. The cabin would be small, but not as loud as you'd expect because you were outrunning most of the sound of the plane. And then, before you knew it, you'd be in Europe in about the amount of time it takes to watch Oppenheimer or Titanic. It was, in many ways, the perfect mode of transport. So, why don't we have it today? Today, if you are a billionaire or the president, it still takes you around seven hours to get across the Atlantic. How is it possible that this technology has gone backwards? 50 years ago, we had supersonic transport before the Sony Walkman existed. And yet today, though our world has sped up tremendously, we have gotten slower. If you Google it, you'll see a lot of different answers for why the Concorde was grounded. A crash in 2000, 9-11 the next year, rising oil prices. But my explanation is a little bit different than everyone else's. I think we have to turn to the world of systems theory. Complex systems can achieve great things because of their complexity, but that same complexity makes them fragile. 
Small disruptions can create a chain of impacts, eventually leading to wholesale collapse. In the case of the Concorde, the crash in 2000 is often cited as its death blow. A small piece of metal had fallen off another plane and it sliced the tires of the Concorde. The plane caught fire and killed 113 people. But in normal times, the Concorde may have been able to withstand this. After all, until this crash, it had enjoyed an almost flawless 24 year record for safety. Surely they'd be able to gain consumer confidence again, but the Concorde represented a system that could only be supported by a complex web of global capitalistic ties. And in 2001, those ties began to buckle. The dot-com bubble burst, destroying $5 trillion with a T from the stock market. Many companies went bankrupt, the exact kinds of companies that would pay 10 grand for their executives to fly across the Atlantic. And then months into this recession, September 11th happens. Demand for plane flights of all kinds plummeted, supersonic or not. Fuel costs were rising, environmental and noise concerns limited the routes the Concorde could fly. But perhaps all of this still could have been overcome were it not for the final nail in the coffin. The Concorde was getting old. After being in service for 27 years, these planes needed significant maintenance and a technological revamp. And Airbus just decided that it was no longer profitable to support these planes. It took a complex system to make the Concorde work, and with shocks on both the demand side of the equation with disaster and recession, and the supply side with an aging model that became unprofitable to support, the Concorde ended, after all, not with a bang, but a whimper. On November 26th, 2003, the Concorde flew for the final time. A marvel of modern engineering, a testament to the wealth and ingenuity of the 20th century, and perhaps it's hubris as well. Maybe we quite literally flew too close to the sun. Today, more than 20 years later, there is still no supersonic passenger plane. The richest person on the planet today is 10 times richer than in 2003. And yet, all their money can't buy them a three hour ticket to London. Sure, we have supersonic military planes still, but they usually only hold a few people and can't be accessed by civilians. So, supersonic passenger transport is dead for good. Or is it? On January 28th, 2025, the startup Boom successfully managed a test supersonic flight without an auditory sonic boom reaching the ground. This is due to something called the Mach cutoff, whereby with the right conditions, a sonic boom can actually refract in the atmosphere and make a U-turn, never hitting the ground. This is an impressive accomplishment, but it's too early to say whether it'll be successful long-term. Two other startups, Exosonic and Arion, recently tried to bring supersonic flight back with similar technology, but they both failed and no longer exist. Perhaps this is for the best. The potential of supersonic flight to damage the ozone layer is very real, but perhaps it's also a good reminder that we are not destined to have the best technology. Science does not move forward inevitably, and human progress is not guaranteed. People forget that about the myth of Icarus. Icarus was advised not to fly too high, or his wings would melt. But he was also warned not to fly too low, or the wings would become waterlogged. Hopefully, unlike Icarus, we can find a way to keep flying.